introduction. It's sort of the tutorial that you know I wish I had when I started LLVM. I first got involved when I was uh, doing an internship at PlayStation a few years ago, and we were hacking on the LLVM compiler a little bit. Uh, so at the time I was a grad student, knew a little bit about compilers, but not a lot about this framework. And I think I was intimidated by its size uh, initially. Um, so today my goal is to kind of lessen that intimidation if you've never touched LLVM. Um, if you have and you are an expert at LLVM, then you know, I welcome your opinions and how we can improve uh, these sorts of talks for beginners to make LLVM a successful and uh, accessible tool. All right, so right from the start, I want to give a little demo uh, of what the uh, little programs are that are going to be sort of walk through uh, during this talk. Uh, that way you know what to pay attention to, uh, or <laughs> you, know, you know if you're in the right room, um, and so on. OK, so I'm going to navigate to the first uh, demo here. And what it is is uh, I'm looking in the top right here. Uh, I have a whole world program, and it's going to analyze the code and print out all the functions uh, in that code. Well, it's just hello world, so there's a hello main, one function in there. So how to write that analysis pass. The next one, uh, demo number two. There's a few uh, functions in a small program. Uh, it's going to count uh, how many basic blocks are in there and how many instructions. So giving us the instruction count. Okay, so a little bit of statistics and analysis about our code. Demo number three. This time we're going to start looking at uh, function caller callee relationships. Uh, just direct calls that are made. Uh, so again, I'll have a simple little program. And we'll see something like direct call to function. The name's a little mangled, add function from main. Uh, so we can get some ideas about what's going on in programs uh, for source code understanding. And demo number four is going to be injecting some code um, into uh, different programs. Uh, so I had a hello world program that prints bonjour, but I was able to uh, manipulate the source a little bit with LLVM to put a little uh, print message at the top when we enter each function. It says, hello, you're running an instrumented binary. Performance may vary while running an instrumented uh, binary. Okay, so those are the tools that I'm going to walk us through. That's what you'll be able to leave uh, this room uh, ready to uh, program. Okay, so those are the four demos. Uh, you'll see them uh, again as we walk through, but in the slides. Okay, so who am I, your speaker? Uh, my name is uh, Mike Shaw. Uh, I'm currently a lecturer over at Northeastern University in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, in the US. I'm about uh, six hours ahead of time uh, now. Uh, I'm interested in computer graphics, game engines, and systems. My research has been in performance tools, a lot of static and dynamic analysis, as well as visualization tools. I like to build things that help uh, make programmers' lives easier. Uh, and I think I'm in good company uh, in this community. Uh, and then I like teaching, guitar, running, weightlifting, uh, pretty much anything computer science is interesting. Uh, and you can find out more about me, my courses, as well as all the slides uh, at my website. OK, so again, this is an introduction to LLVM. Uh, I have some specific goals to sort of kickstart the day uh, for the rest of uh, your sessions. So figuring out what is LLVM in that project, uh, understanding how to obtain and install LLVM. This is something I'll go through quick, because we don't all have time to uh, compile and build the source. Uh, but I found a lot of students that I've taught, they sort of struggle at this point. So I'll give you a cheat sheet. Um, I'll have little examples with uh, LLVM and uh, Clang and some of the tools. Uh, and then how to produce the demos that I've shown. I'm going to actually show all the source code, uh, which uh, just as a warning, I'm going to break a lot of uh, presentation rules. There's going to be code here, lots of long sentences, uh, but that's okay. Because uh, we want a good uh, slide deck we can review later. And this is for you guys, your goals for tomorrow, uh, to start thinking about some solutions what you can do after you've learned a little bit about LLVM. Uh, you know, what's going to keep you motivated, keep you growing, and think about how you make your lives easier as programmers. 
Uh, and again, as I mentioned, you know, I want you to be able to run through these uh, slides again with confidence and excitement uh, if you haven't uh, worked with LLVM previously. Okay. And all these slides in the code are going to be at my website, uh, slash fosdom 18html uh, uh, and I'll make sure that URL is in the top left of the uh, most of the slides as well. Okay, so what is uh, LLVM? It's a project uh, started at the University of Illinois uh, around 2000. Uh, Chris Slatner was the lead architect. Uh, here he is. Uh, he was at Apple for a long time, now at Tesla, uh, but still contributes. You might know his contributions with Swift. Uh, but the LLVM project itself is backed by a lot of major uh, companies uh, like Intel, Apple, uh, Google, and so on. Uh, but the important thing, of course, about this project is that it's open source, so anyone can contribute to it. Anyone can get the uh, source and commit their uh, updates uh, upstream. But I guess the real good question is, you know, you know it's great that it's open source and, and popular, but you know, what makes LLVM the tool that, you know, a lot of uh, programmers are paying attention to it right now? It's getting a lot of attention. You know, why is it winning awards? Well, the secret recipe, uh, you know, if we want to just look, it's in the uh, research paper <laughs> published in 2004 that kind of describes the details and the internals. Uh, of course, we have the, the source code. Uh, but I want to talk about uh, Chris Latner's big idea. Uh, this was from uh, him himself uh, when he was a graduate student um, in the early 2000s. Okay, so he was thinking about compilers early on during his graduate work. Uh, and if, you know, briefly I refresh the idea of the compiler, it's to generate high level language to machine code, right? We don't write in ones and zeros. So we have our C++ source or, or language of choice. It gets uh, lexed and parsed to make sure it's a valid program. It's sort of optionally, I guess, uh, an optimizer that uh, optimizes and makes our code better for us. And a back end that uh, generates code uh, and gives us uh, the code for our uh, machines. Okay, then we can finally execute our programs. So around this time, 2000, uh, and maybe even before, uh, JIT compilers or just-in-time compilers uh, we're really continuing to uh, gain traction. You know, languages like Java uh, that have these virtual machines that could compile code online. So as they're sort of running, they're about to run. Uh, but as they're doing this, you know, every time you run a Java program, uh, not this time, it had to perform optimizations over and over and over again, right? Every time you, you run the program. Okay, so at the time, uh, Latner uh, and his advisor and some others uh, their big idea was, you know, can we perform these compiler optimizations uh, at compile time uh, and really try to, you know, how much of the heavy lifting could we move to compile time before we run a program uh, and increase performance? Uh, so he was thinking about some uh, low-level virtual machine. Uh, of course, if we notice, uh, <laughs> low-level virtual machine, uh, LLVM. Uh, so that's where the name originally came from. Uh, now the project is just referred to as LLVM uh, itself. Okay, so in the middle of our compiler pipeline, uh, there's this optimizer. So that's going to become the focus uh, of this project, or at least Latner uh, and his team uh, in the early 2000s. Okay, so typically, you know, what's going on? Uh, during the optimization stage for compilers, uh, there's some intermediate representation or some intermediate language um, that the high-level language gets translated into. Okay, and this is something that has more of a regular language, something that can be uh, manipulated a little bit easier. Okay, um, just sort of thinking about this, why we would want an intermediate representation. Well, think about how many ways you could write a C or C++ program that uh, you know, achieve the same thing. Um, but can we have a better, more regular structure? Okay, so here's just an example of what an IR instruction looks like in LLVM. Uh, it's a branch instruction. Uh, so 
branching over some condition if it's true or false, and then jumping. Uh, so it looks like assembly. OK. So let me jump into how to get LFEM at this point. So we're starting to get a little bit excited about it. Now we want to download and try, uh, and all the tools. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm actually going to run through this uh, very quickly. Um, and in the future, you can use it as a reference uh, for getting set up on your own. Uh, and I do want to mention that the LLVM project is evolving at a rather uh, rapid pace. Uh, the main uh, sort of architects and folks contributing to it are willing to make sort of breaking changes uh, to improve the tool. Uh, so it's always growing. Uh, so typically when I'm uh, working with LLVM, I'm always building from a uh, source, from one of the latest versions. <coughs> and the instructions where they'll always be uh, is at this uh, getting started page. Uh, that's where you can figure out where to download the repos uh, from SVN and so on. For this talk, all of my examples are working with uh, LLVM 5.0. Uh, they should work on most of the previous versions as well. Uh, I'm running on a Ubuntu machine, uh, version 16. It's a x86 uh, architecture. Uh, and similar instructions will work on Mac and so on. Uh, tools you'll need, SVN, CMake, Make, uh, some C compiler, and, and that's about it. Uh, so how to get started? Create a directory, something typically with maybe the date when you're downloading. Within the folder, I create a few uh, different directories. A build directory, that's where your binaries will go, and then your source. Keep your project nice and organized. And then all oh, about 12 steps from downloading the relevant projects to uh, actually getting to make. Okay, so This is my, uh, my cheat sheet for you to follow later on. Um, so after you've <laughs> sort of followed these steps, uh, you, know, you want to take a little break, get a stretch. Uh, you know, depending on the speed of your uh, CPU, <laughs> um, you know, it takes me about 15 plus minutes at least. Um, and you'll know it worked when you check your build directory. It's going to look something like this. There's going to be a bunch of binary files, uh, Clang, uh, and various tools. Okay. Uh, and this is, these are all the resources that you get here. Uh, and I'm sort of uh, heeding that, you know, your system, you might already have Clang uh, or some compiler installed through some package manager or, you know, native on your operating system. Uh, but we want to, again, build from source. Uh, the version matter uh, often matters when we're building tools. Okay? As I mentioned, uh, they're always pushing uh, the project forward. Okay, so at this point, let's just assume LLVM's uh, up and running uh, at this point in the uh, slide deck. And our first example, uh, emitting LLVM's intermediate representation. So I mentioned, you know, this is sort of the important part for the uh, optimizer, uh, not just trying to look at pure uh, C or C++ or whatever code. Uh, the compiler that we do this with is the uh, Clang++ compiler, or CLang++, okay, for the C and C++ language. Uh, and they can generate code that targets this uh, intermediate representation. So if I try, uh, here's our sort of working uh, Hello World program, uh, just printing a message. Uh, bonjour. I do speak uh, French and English. So if we compile and run it, that's it. Hello, and uh, it works. I'm sure. Uh, but then, you know, we want to make sure that we're installing and working with uh, the version of Clang uh, that we built from uh, from source. Uh, so you can do this by checking version, and yep, we're at version five. Uh, we've got our architecture uh, and where exactly it was installed here. Everything looks good. All right, so now we can use uh, 
planning to emit some LLVM, get the IR, and keep talking about this step at the optimizer. So to do this uh, with Clang, we have some options, uh, dash s, and emit LLVM in our source file. Dash s, uh, similar to other compilers, tells you uh, only run the preprocessor and compilation steps, so generate something. And the specific thing we're generating is uh, the LLVM representation. Okay, that's sort of our uh, assembly here. Now, as a quick aside, uh, you know, Clang++, plus plus, isn't this an LLVM talk? Aren't we supposed to only talk LLVM? Uh, well, the news is, uh, you know, since 2000, this project's grown really big, so there's a lot of tools. I'm going to touch on a lot of what I think are the important tools in the uh, LLVM umbrella of projects. Yeah. So, jumping into our first one is, of course, Clang. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, if you're on a Mac, uh, likely you've already used Clang. Uh, that's uh, Apple's default compiler. Okay. So, you know, Clang or perhaps other tools can work with this LLVM. Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> We're in the right place. Okay. So the key feature here uh, is that if we have these language front ends, whether it's Clang or something else, I can just target this intermediate representation. Okay, and then the optimizer can uh, work on that IR here. So whether we're in C, Fortran, Ada, Objective-C, Swift, or whatever, uh, we can get to this common optimizer. Uh, and then there's separate code generators uh, from each of those intermediate representations for our architecture. Okay? I won't be talking as much about this part during the talk, but I'll have some resources at the end if that's interesting. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the IR. Oh, first, how about a, a pop quiz uh, to wake everyone up? Uh, I know it's a little bit blurry, but from the audience, uh, you know, what do you think this function does? Adds two values. <laughs> Adds two values, yeah. Perfect. You're awake. Uh, well, yeah, it is named add one. You got it. <laughs> I didn't make it too hard. Uh, and there's two arguments, you got it. Uh, I32 something, an A and a B. I32 looks like an integer, it's an integer. It's unsigned? It's unsigned or signed? Uh, unsigned, yeah. And every function, we've got this uh, entry point, so this is where we uh, enter. <coughs> we have to start somewhere. I store the results of our addition. This is a actual add instruction, sort of capturing what's going on. Uh, you can think of this again like an uh, assembly. It's taking our two arguments, A and B. And then uh, returning the result on, as a type here uh, from temp1, whatever it is from this add instruction. Okay, so if you can read assembly, uh, from your school days, or even C, if you program C, uh, you can understand this intermediate representation. It's quite nice. It's very uh, readable. Okay, so into LLVM's secret sauce, which really is this intermediate representation. Okay, so as mentioned, this IR, as long as we can get our front end language to it, um, you know, we can uh, optimize it commonly. It's fairly readable, fairly writable. You could actually write programs in this IR. Uh, might, you know, take an additional effort, but I've seen it done. I've done it. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of a, it's a little bit more uh, of a well-defined language in the sense that, you know, a lot of these compilers that try to achieve the same thing, they'll target, you know, C or something and then just sort of bootstrap that as their intermediate language. Um, yeah, I might say this is a little bit well defined. Uh, the IR itself is strongly typed. We saw that I32, so that means there are uh, types, even pointers uh, can be defined uh, with a star. 
there's what's known as an infinite number of registers, right? So from uh, your assembly programming, if you have experience, you didn't see percent RAX, RDX, R15, or whatever, uh, you know, 16 general purpose registers, you have infinite, okay? Uh, so you get these temporary registers, as many as you want, uh, and that's useful for us uh, in what's called single static assignment, okay? Which is a way for us to sort of analyze programs in this intermediate form and make various optimizations, a lot of the common ones. Okay, so quick aside, just on single static assignment, uh, sort of from the wiki page, uh, what this is is where you can, um, I guess starting on the right side, assign every single variable uh, a unique uh, name here. Then you can capture, you know, that there's some redundancy. Oh, x1 is y2 for this assignment, so we can get rid of something. Okay, so that would be an example of a uh, simple optimization, some of the common ones from compilers. Okay, so more on the uh, IR from the uh, open source architecture book from Latner himself. Uh, this is a great resource on that. Okay, so back to using our tools, uh, using Clang++ and generating some IR. Well, here it is from our Hello World program. Uh, I'm emitting uh, LLVM IR. And what I get when I do this is a uh, .ll file, a two lowercase l's. Uh, and this gives me a, the textual readable form that we had looked at, that branch and that simple uh, add instruction. Okay. Uh, and here it is. Uh, so this is uh, Hello World. Uh, there's just a tiny bit more here, but this is all the code that does the work. And I'll pause for a second so you can look at it and uh, sort of take some audience feedback, maybe from the front rows if you can read the source. Um, you know, what do you see here? What sort of stands out um, from this instructions? Call printf. Call printf. Okay, so we see uh, the functions that are done, and there's a call instruction here. So we can sort of trace it. We see our functions. Anything else? What do you see? Any? Yeah, we see a uh, string on jewelers encoded in there, just like it would be an uh, assembly in like the uh, the data section. Um, it's explicit alignment. It's explicit alignment. Yeah, so that might be important for our uh, architectures we're targeting, right? Uh, what else? There's a, a target here. This target triple telling me uh, this is a x86-64 uh, machine. That's generating code in for. It was generated on it, or it can only run on it. Pardon? It was generated on it, or it can only run on it. Uh, generated for this machine to run it, yeah. So that's telling me. Should it work on all machines? All types? Uh, yeah, so I can target different architectures. I've targeted uh, my machine for this. Yeah. Line nine, yeah. So these are the uh, alocas. So um, sort of our, our stack pointer here. Yeah. The IR is machine specific. The IR is uh, not machine specific, uh, meaning that this is the same sort of IR I'll get on other machines, uh, but from this IR. Uh, I'll generate the assembly for my target architecture. Um, so if it's a, a power PC, an ARM machine, uh, x86, this will get translated later um, in the back end stage. Yeah. So somehow printf comes from a library, but I cannot see why it's being referred to. Yeah. So printf, uh, we cheat a little bit here in that the, the C library is sort of uh, linked in with the compiler, uh, so we know about printf. Uh, when we do other, uh, I've kept these, if you uh, do other ones, like uh, even like C++ IO stream, you'll see the code sort of explode. Uh, so, <laughs> but yeah, these are all good, uh, good person, findings here. Percent 1 is not used, so this is not yet optimized. Pardon? Percent 1 is not used. Percent 1 is not used here. 
it's allocated, stored, but nothing done with it? Yeah. It's not optimized yet. Not optimized, yeah. I haven't run any uh, passes on it. That's true. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. These were things I noticed. Um, you know, source files there. You guys got the data layout. Uh, that's got to be sort of with this file. Uh, as mentioned, so when you target uh, your, your machines that you're compiling for, you can do so. Again, lots of these percent signs, that's because we have infinite registers. Uh, there's no optimization yet. I haven't run uh, anything on this, on the optimizer. We'll get to that. Um, there are things called phi nodes that are sort of selectors that come up, uh, but none of them are here. Uh, and then the type information. And at the very end, there's some of the sort of metadata and attributes. Um, that are sort of hints to the compiler how to optimize. Yeah. So I cannot change the name of a, uh, a register. I cannot assign a second time sensitive to a register since they're infinite and there's this SSA. Uh, so you cannot, yeah, you'll get a new, they need to be unique. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all registers are redundant somehow. Um, uh, you assign once. Uh, assign, assign once, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Everyone uh, good? Yeah, good questions. Okay, uh, so then as alluded to from this common optimizer, that's the information we need to target uh, our backends here. Okay. Okay, well, hopefully we're uh, enjoying the uh, IR readability. <laughs> and the machines uh, enjoy it too. Because this leads us to our next tool, uh, LLI. Uh, it's an execution engine that directly executes program bit code uh, using its own uh, JIT compiler. So there's a JIT compiler here. Okay. Okay, and because it's you know very readable, I think this uh, sort of assists in this project. Um, so if I actually want to uh, run this program, you know I haven't generated any executables or binaries yet. I'm just doing LLI hello. And then this is our textual uh, bit code again. And I get the same output for uh, Bonjour. OK, so that's pretty neat. I can just run it really quick like that. Now, of course, the uh, intermediate representation has another form, uh, a binary form called bit code with uh, .bc extensions. Uh, and then I have you know, the binary data is a little bit more compact. Uh, and that can also run through the, uh, the, the LLI tool. Are, are the two meant to be uh, alternative representation for the same thing? So you, you can convert uh, from... Exactly. The yep. You can convert back and forth um, as you need. Yeah. Uh, one for uh, readability, programming, inspection. Uh, the other for, yeah, compactness and, uh, you know, if you have a lot of these files. Yeah. Come on. Um, is, is it a yes? Yeah, same thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah I know they, they use the bit code, but same uh, representation, yeah. Good. Okay, uh, so our next tool, LLVM uh, AS, the assembler, takes the IR and assembly form and it converts it to that bit code form. Okay, so if we want to do that, it's as simple as uh, feeding in the .ll file. If I list the contents, I'll get a new uh, bc file uh, and be ready to go. If I look at that, again, I can also run through LLI. Same output, still good to go. So same program, same representation. Uh, in general, uh, we don't want compilers making a sort of these breaking changes, so change it, uh, <laughs> they're uh, preserved changes. Okay, so uh, I execute the bit code, and my claim is, uh, you know, maybe the JIT engine uh, can execute more efficiently, guesses why, in that form. It knows the input data. Yeah, it knows the input data, uh, more compact. Uh, I think a lot of these uh, programming languages like uh, Python even sort of uh, compiles into its own uh, bytecode. 
uh, so it can execute quicker. You know, and here's what it looks like. So it truly is a binary representation that you can't read. And of course, once you start getting a lot of these files and they get big, uh, the bit code's much, much smaller, much, much more compressed. OK, so we've done this uh, bit code, but eventually we do want to generate our assembly uh, for some target machine and you know, build a, an executable that we can distribute to someone. To do this, our tool is LLC, and that's the uh, static compiler. It uh, takes in uh, this IR or bit code uh, and converts it to assembly code. Okay, same things we're doing before. We just run the tool on the bit code. If I list it out, I'll see a uh, .s file for the assembly. And here it is, hello.s. Uh, then if you uh, enjoy reading the assembly, it's there for you. The LL is the human-readable language. Correct, yeah. LL is human-readable. The BC is the binary. And then the .s is assembly, which we'll debate about human-readable or not. <laughs> OK, so this is the full circle. Uh, LLVM, the project itself, a lot of people have worked hard on it uh, to target many different machines. So you can actually uh, pass this flag in uh, for CPU. Uh, and see all the different uh, architectures that you can uh, generate code for. Uh, this list uh, goes on much, much deeper than uh, what I've shown here. Okay. And at this point, you know, we've gotten uh, familiar with some of the IR, playing around with the tools, the compiler uh, tool chain, uh, but we haven't utilized the optimizer yet. Again, uh, Latner's big idea here with this project. So that brings us to uh, the next tool, which is opt. Uh, this is the LLVM. Uh, it's the analyzer, but also the optimizer. Okay, so it'll run uh, optimizations on our programs. Okay, so I'm going to run opt uh, again on our hello program. So run opt on a uh, textual bit code. Uh, and then I've got this little uh, time passes. Uh, flag. Uh, so basically what this is doing is there's a bunch of optimizations you can apply. I'm not applying any right now. Uh, so I get a list of my passes. There's just a verifier here to make sure it's a uh, valid input and that's it. Okay, But I'm timing uh, passes here. So I want to introduce the idea of uh, passes uh, with the uh, op tool or the optimizer. Okay, so uh, just as your uh, compiler might look through the source code many times to build your program, uh, the optimizer can cycle through uh, your source code uh, or the bit code many times, looking for opportunities at work and optimize. Okay, and there's several different ways uh, that we can do this. Again, focusing on passes. And the sort of LLVM way is you have different granularities of how you want to sort of inspect your code. Uh, it's sort of a higher level, a sort of source file level you can think of. There's a module pass that'll look through the feed in a, a full module. A call graph pass sort of traverses a uh, module uh, bottom up. Function pass. That runs over individual functions, so every function that you have in a program. Basic block passes that run over uh, all the, the blocks, uh, you know, anywhere between uh, the curly braces in C++, essentially. Uh, and then there's a few other uh, types of passes. There might even be more uh, added in the future. Uh, and even within these two passes, there's uh, analysis passes and transform passes. Analysis where you're sort of gathering information. That's mostly what I'm focusing on. Uh, and then I have a couple examples. Uh, but then there's transform passes where you're actually uh, sort of mutating the program. There's some uh, side effect to the original code. Okay. 
So our next task, next thing to uh, get introduced to, is how to uh, analyze IR with this pass framework. Okay, so this leads us down the road of code optimizations, uh, code understanding, more so we'll start in uh, you know, other ideas that you can think of. Machine code generation and so on. All right, so I've got a task. Uh, I want to print all the functions uh, in a program, maybe to get a list or to see where they're coming from. Uh, what kind of pass uh, should we use for that? Uh, any guesses from the audience? Function pass. Function pass. You got it. Yeah. It's appropriately named, so I'll take that. Yep. It runs over uh, each individual function. <laughs> That's how it's structured. Uh, yeah. I would maybe other, um, we'll, we'll see an example of a module pass, um, but yeah, that can do the job. Function pass is the uh, the correct answer. Okay, so writing our first function pass. So where you'll be working uh, when you try this is in the uh, in your source llvm lib slash transforms. There's a hello project in hello.cpp, uh, and that's where you get started. Um, so it's all configured. It's in the build system, so you can just hit make uh, as you make changes. Uh, and can use this as sort of a sandbox to explore the LVM project. Uh, and as you sort of continue on, you can add more passes. Uh, that's pretty well documented uh, how to do that. Uh, and code box here is sort of what it looks like. I'm in the uh, terminal land most of the time. Uh, OK, so here it is, hello.cpp. This is code uh, from LVM, not from me. Here it is, nice and bright. Here's the piece we care about, though. Uh, there's this uh, function. We'll walk through the rest. Uh, it returns a Boolean. It's run on function. Uh, it takes a function in as an argument to reference that function. Uh, then it's going to, these errors is sort of LLVM's uh, C out or printf, a uh, way to safely do that. Hello, colon, and then write out. Uh, f dot get name, so the function name. Uh, then it returns false because uh, it's not making any changes. Okay, we'll look at that again uh, shortly. Uh, so let's uh, build our hello pass. Uh, so how you do this? You navigate to the lib transform slow directory. Uh, within your build directory, there's a make file. Uh, if you follow the instruction that's found, you type make. Uh, and it'll build for you. Okay, it'll build a library. <coughs> so this is our pass as it's built. Uh, it's in our uh, libs uh, folder in the build directory. I see it way up there. LLVM hello dot uh, sl. Okay, so it's a library there. So when we want to run our first pass. Again, we're doing this with the opt tool. Uh, we've treated this sort of as an optimization. So we're starting with opt. Uh, we choose which uh, library we want to load. Uh, so sort of which, which plugin, I guess. It's the LLVM uh, hello library. And within it, uh, we can have multiple uh, passes. So we have one that's just hello. And then the optimizer runs on uh, bitcode. Uh, so our input's the hello.bc uh, file. So the hello before the lower than sign is the name of the, the, the pass that's going to print the function. Yes. It has nothing to do with the name of the file. It's just a coincidence. Correct, yes. Yeah. It is. Uh, the name is overloaded here. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So if I run this. Uh, as I have, uh, you'll see a tiny printout here. Hello, main. So there's just one function in our hello world. Uh, so that works. Okay, that was all there was to it to, to print out uh, the functions in our source code. Okay, so that's good. So let's kind of go over the, the anatomy of the past, some of the parts I skipped over. Okay, 
So again, this run on function, this is the piece that does the work. We're returning false. And because this is sort of just an analysis pass, it's not making any changes uh, to the code, any transformations. It's just giving me information. Uh, we're inheriting from the function pass uh, the class here. And then this is where the uh, name comes in. You asked about the hello, uh, but you sort of you register a, this as a pass, sort of the, the pass manager. So I'm going to register this pass, uh, hello. That's the name of my struct. Hello is what we're going to call it. So that's what I was referring to it on the uh, command line. Uh, then you can do a uh, description uh, if you want to give your users help when they're on the command line. Um, and other attributes. That's what we care about. This is C++. C++, yes. So you can write the pass in any language. Uh, yes, there are, yeah. We can write uh, Python in particular. I've seen a lot of uh, passes. There's uh, some libraries for that, yeah. Uh, as long as you can, um, uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> this is the final answer. OK, so again, that's how I knew what to type here. OK, so congratulations. You know, we did it. Um, and this also proves you know, LLVM is properly configured. So this is where you're going to start. OK, so I want to move a little bit forward. Uh, this first pass is sort of getting at a uh, static analysis. Uh, brief reminder on what static analysis is. Uh, you know, what kind of information, bugs, performance, errors can you uncover before you run the program? Okay, to aid the programmer. Uh, you know, it's a great way to get full coverage of the program, what's going on. Cons, you know, you're not actually running the program and you might be overly conservative exploring code that actually doesn't run. Um, so, you know, that computation might grow uh, unnecessarily. Okay, so let's build a, a second pass. And this time I want to collect some uh, program data. Okay, so it's going to print the function name, and it's going to count basic blocks and instruction counts. Okay, and I'm going to use this new uh, sample code, uh, and then you can try on your own. Uh, I've got two functions here: a countdown function, or rather, count up function to ten. Uh, here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It'll still uh, still work as intended. Uh, have that, our add function here, uh, and then from our main, I just print out the add and uh, run the countdown, count up, or whatever. Okay, so that program's uh, called Loops. I'm gonna compile and run it. Uh, we can use our previous test. Uh, hello. Uh, this time on the loops.l, so that's what I'm swapping out. And we'll see, yeah, there's three functions here, countdown, add, and main. So it's still working. Uh, how can we expand on it? So here's our second pass. Uh, again, function pass is probably the right uh, tool for this. And uh, this is it. This is the code that does it. Um, so again, within the run on function body, that's where uh, our work's being done. I'm going to create uh, two integers to keep track of the basic blocks and the instruction counts. And then within these, uh, for each function, I'm going to iterate through each basic block. And within each of those basic blocks, iterate through the instructions. OK, so once I have a function, I can sort of keep working down and drilling to smaller granularities. Okay, I'm watching that. I can't really work up as well. And once I have that information, I'll uh, print it out, the basic block count uh, and the instruction count. Okay? So this is a, a common pattern you'll see. Uh, now, of course, I've modified our uh, hello CPP, so I've got to... Uh, Save it, make again, uh, as previously done, to build a new version of our uh, library. 
the other changes I've also, uh, this is hello to now. Okay, so I'm going to run hello to on that code and see how many basic blocks there are, instructions. Uh, looks like countdowns are most uh, intense function here. Uh, and it works. That's kind of nice. Even a primitive tool like this, you know, if you're running optimizations on your compiler at O of 3, O of 2, sort of experimenting with inlines, you can see if your functions are growing or shrinking and get an idea of uh, program size. It's from a little tool like this. Okay. Okay. And again, we're running hello too. And again, as a reminder, what the function pass is doing, it's running on each function individually. It doesn't know about the other functions. Uh, so I didn't need to reset uh, variables or anything like that. Okay. So if I want to sort of store what information there is about other functions, I need to write my own data structure for that, uh, which you can do. All right, so let's keep going uh, and try to think about what we can do with some of this uh, instruction information or just build other uh, passes that are interesting. Uh, and here's some uh, homework for later. Again, I'm not pulling these ideas uh, you know, from nowhere. Uh, but the uh, LLVM writing an LLVM pass uh, guide, that's a sort of definitive guide on, on these uh, passes here. OK, so I want to move to our uh, third pass, another function pass. And this time, it's going to show direct function calls. Uh, so I can figure out which functions are calling other ones. All right, here it is. I'm sure folks in the back can read this. <laughs> Don't worry. All the code's online. Uh, I'll zoom in a little bit on the parts that matter, uh, a tiny bit. Uh, this time I'm including a new header, uh, LLVM slash IR slash call site. That sounds like something that might be useful for figuring out if uh, functions are calling other functions. And, you know, so there is some... Uh, object here I'm instantiating, a call site. OK, so there's a lot of these different tools in LLVM. Uh, again, I'm not an expert. I don't uh, you know, know all the commands by heart. So where am I going to go to get help? Uh, the LLVM docs, of course. Uh, and often, you know, the strategy, the appropriate strategy is LLVM, space, you know, and Google, and whatever it is. That will bring you to uh, this uh, Doxygen uh, documentation pages. OK, and they're, they're pretty good. You know, even if I uh, go to this site, I can jump uh, and see all the overloaded versions of call site to see how it's sort of used. And the other common thing I do, you know, uh, you know if you remember, we compile it from source, so we have all the source code. Um, so you can practice, you know, your, your sort of grep uh, skills here. Uh, and grep for get instruction or call site, and you'll see all the different ways that it's used in the project. So that's how I like to learn about how some of these things are used. Uh, right? If your project's successfully built, you'll probably find a working example here. <laughs> OK, so continuing on with the uh, third pass on finding uh, function calls. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do, once I have a call site, I'm checking that instruction to see, well, was our instruction something that was callable? Was it a uh, function in the first place? Uh, so I, so if, it is a, if it's an instruction at all, I check. And then uh, if it is, I can figure out get called value, strip pointer cast. I can't deal with uh, function pointers yet or, or, or weird things like that. Um, but I can just cast this to a function and figure out what that instruction is. Okay, so I've cast it to a function f here. So that means if my function pass is running at this point, I'm going to get direct calls to function 
f get name, the function I found within my function, and it's from uppercase f, which is our function. Okay. So the result in our sort of uh, loops program, I'm going to see direct call to function or add function from main. Direct call to function printf from main. Direct call to function countdown from main. Okay, we call the three functions there. So again, it's a simple little function pass. Uh, but what's interesting about this one is how you can start um, seeing the need or uh, maybe the ability or power to build your own data structure from here. Okay, so I've got some edges now uh, at this point. Um, so if I have those edges, now I can think about what kind of graph structure can I build. Uh, so I can actually visualize the program and, and hand this off to someone. Okay, and that could be a very useful thing in a project. Uh, you know, so we'd call this a, uh, a static graph that we could output. Okay, uh, here's a little bonus trick on uh, outputting graphs. LLVM actually provides uh, a pass for us that can output uh, control flow graphs. So a control flow graph, if I'm looking at a, uh, a function, uh, what pass can it take? Where does it branch? Okay, so to do this, install some dot file viewer. That's the format, uh, DOT files. Uh, I prefer uh, x dot works pretty well. And we'll view the uh, dot file for the uh, countdown, or remember count up uh, function, and see what's going on. So if I look at it, uh, what LLVM gives me, here's our C++ source code. Uh, and it gives me a nice control flow graph here. And I can see and sort of trace where it's going. There's one branch here. This is where the while condition's uh, choosing true or false, where we just return. OK, so that's a nice uh, a debugging tool here. Uh, you know, what's also nice about this, as you're sort of learning about uh, the IR and getting familiar with it, is you can always just look directly at the IR of the function here. Uh, in two different views and sort of map it back and forth, see how it's broken apart. Okay, so this is again another way of how I sort of trace through programs uh, to learn. Uh, so if you're thinking about building a compiler uh, that targets the LLVM IR, uh, this might be an appropriate uh, place to start. Okay, so we've got three passes that uh, gather attributes statically, uh, give us some interesting information. Uh, but now I want to move us towards a uh, dynamic analysis. Okay? So dynamic analysis, our goal is to figure out you know, what information, bugs, you know, performance errors uh, can we uncover when the program is actually running. Okay? So we're going to add something to the program to monitor how it's functioning. Of course, the pros is this gives us real values for wherever the code executes. The cons, well, you've instrumented it, so you've sort of changed behavior a little bit, uh, but hopefully to learn something valuable. Why use LLVM for this? You know, there's a lot of different profiling tools. Um, but, you know, we have total control if you have the source code to sort of monitor and inject and where at uh, in our code. Right? We're not at the, the whim of the uh, profiler. So I want to add in some functions here. Uh, typically, you know, if you're going to do this uh, on your own, you're doing this in an ad hoc fashion, just sort of scattering printfs everywhere uh, on your project, or lots of pound defines, uh, end ifs. Uh, but again, if we have the source code in this nice tool, uh, LLVM, we can sort of inject as needed and then take that instrumentation out, uh, which is nice. Uh, and again, fair warning, I'm going to put a lot of code on the slides and. Uh, I'll talk through them, uh, but you have these uh, later. Okay, so step one of this process, uh, we write some code that we want to instrument. That means another example. Uh, okay, this is sort of our uh, our hook uh, code, hook, or excuse me, the, the code we're going to instrument is just our hello world program. The hook into that code, I wrote a little function called init main. 
uh, that's going to print a little message out once we enter main. Okay, so this happens when you enter a function. That's going to say, hello, you're running an instrumented binary. Performance may vary uh, while running instrumented uh, binary programs. Okay, and you could run this on any, any uh, function. So, uh, ooh, step one again, I guess, <laughs> is to uh, generate IR for the hook. Uh, so that little uh, function that we're going to be inserting, the init main, uh, create the uh, IR representation. Well, we know how to do that using Clang. And we just emit this, this chunk out. Okay, so we've got it, this function. So there it is. There's our function. Uh, the name is mangled. Uh, so if you've sort of worked in uh, compilers, that means it's going to look a little funky. At z1 underscore underscore init main i uh, there. Uh, you can unmangle it. I'm just working with the mangled name. Here's our code we want to modify, just a simple program uh, as an example. And now it's time for, uh, I think, a module pass is uh, appropriate for this. Uh, why? You know, I want to show you a module pass. Uh, and, it <laughs> and it sort of makes a little bit more sense to me just to, at a module level or a bigger level, to, to work down. Okay. Uh, so modules are, you know, they have a collection of functions uh, in them that we can instrument. All right, so here it is. Here's the, the big code. Uh, and the dark screen. <laughs> uh, but there's three parts here. Uh, let me tell them you know, what they are. Now, first thing I do is I create a, a sort of stub function uh, for that, uh, that hook function, that init main that's going to get inserted in uh, our main function. OK, so this is sort of like giving a, uh, uh, a declaration that, hey, this function exists. Okay. Uh, just like in your regular programs. Um, okay. And again, it's the, it's the mangled name. That's what it understands. Uh, so it's exactly underscore Z10 underscore underscore in it main I. The next chunk of code, what this block is doing, since we're in a module, well, just like we in, uh, iterated through basic blocks and instructions before, a module has a collection of functions that I can iterate through. So that's what it's doing here. Okay, going to look through all the functions. And what it's doing in this code is the first thing is I'm ignoring my instrumented functions if I run into those. I don't want to instrument an instrumented function and sort of recursively do that. Uh, the second thing I'm doing is I'm looking for a particular function uh, main in this case. Okay. And I am modifying code, so I'm returning true here for this pass. This pass, again, is a run on module pass. That's taking in a module, module M. Okay, so that setup hooks function uh, what is it doing? Well, it's creating a uh, placeholder for that function, as I mentioned. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about here is that the observation is if I'm, if I'm putting in a little placeholder or a stub, I'm sort of building up this function. Uh, let's see here. Uh, well, you know, that has to match the signature of main. Uh, the, my function main, it returns void, and it takes in one parameter, which is an integer. Okay, so that's the little stub I've got to build up. Okay, so this is how I do it. Um, and you know, what this sort of reminds me of is, again, a code generator. So if you're building a programming language or something, these are the sort of functions you're going to be using uh, to build little stubs. Okay, and then this is sort of the big function. Uh, that's not going to fit on the slide. Uh, but it's well sort of commented uh, in my examples again on mshot.io slash fosdom18. Uh, but what the instrument uh, enter function is doing is sort of just choosing the specific function uh, to insert here. Um, so it actually almost looks, it looks very similar to uh, the setup hooks function, except there's a uh, get or insert function 
and then I'm putting that uh, stub in there. Okay, and that's it. Uh, if you look at the code, um, you know, we don't need to do anything fancy for this profiling, but I've given an example that shows how to send in one parameter um, so you have that. That took me forever to figure out uh, back in the day. Um, so learn from that. Okay. So I've written this code. Uh, I've compiled and made it, and it works. Uh, so the next step is um, to, well, run our pass. So I'm going to run it. Uh, on our hello world program, our hello. And I'm going to call it ready to be hooked. That's the uh, LL uh, file I'm going to emit. So, so this is something new where I run opt with an optimization, and I'm making sure that I sort of save it somewhere. Right? This is the optimize. It's been transformed, so it's a different file. I'm not just getting uh, information back like our previous passes. Uh, and once I do that, I link in our instrumentation. OK? So remember, uh, our very first step was to compile that hook function in its own uh, IR. So then I'm going to merge them together, link them in. OK? And you knew we were missing one on here if you're watching close. <laughs> the LLVM link tool links two or more bit code files into one. So that way, if we have that um, definition or declaration of our function, there should be the definition somewhere. OK? So it's all there. So our files are all merged. Okay, LLVM link, we can think of this tool uh, as the linker for our IR code. Uh, sort of a, uh, a cheap uh, version of a linker that's just smashing all the files together. Uh, but what is kind of nice about this is, you know, you can think about the little analyses that we've been doing on these small programs. And, well, if you have a lot of LL files, why not merge them all together? And then all of a sudden, you can maybe do a whole program optimization or sort of a whole program analysis. OK? OK. So if I've linked everything together, uh, I'm going to output this as instrument demo. That's our full textual file. And the grand finale. Uh, when I run it, again with LLI, one of our previous tools, uh, take my word for it that it instruments the main. Hello, you're running an instrumented uh, binary. Performance may vary, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, we get to print. Printf, bonjour. All right, pretty cool. So it works. OK, questions about that last pass? Maybe time to think about it. Now I'm going to send us into uh, wrapping up here. So again, you know, if this is your first uh, days with LLVM, uh, some challenges to try. Uh, things like printing out function arguments, uh, exploring the documentation, figuring out how to get those args, uh, recovering some uh, metadata uh, from different optimizations that are already running. There's things like profile guided optimizations that the compiler uses. Um, how can you access those? Things like maybe writing a little Python script that just links together all of your source files. Uh, think about how you could do that. Uh, moving on, you know, the next week I might try something like building your own uh, control flow graph or some call graph. Uh, again, how do you put those edges together and build a function? Uh, a full tree there. Uh, different attributes can be found in functions to so figure out how to get at that metadata. Uh, maybe you can figure out uh, from our basic stat pass, if we've got a lot of really small functions, maybe 10 instructions or less, tell the compiler to inline those. Okay, that could be a cheap little uh, optimization. Again, very simple tool, but um, might add performance. Might not, but fun experiment to try. <laughs> uh, and sort of, I don't know if they're hard, but interesting problems. You can look at sort of these auto vectorizing uh, instructions, see if you can play around with uh, inserting some SIMD uh, instructions. Um, and there's these other things uh, that I didn't talk about as far as tools, but I have to mention uh, the sanitizers. I'll tell you things like uh, about memory safety or thread safety in your program. Okay, see if you can at least run them, um, and then see if you can modify the code because you have it. 
uh, and do some interesting printouts to see what's going on. Okay, so that's uh, the syllabus going forward. <coughs> Resources. Uh, I've got a big list here, uh, so you can sort of look through it. The weekly LLVM newsletter is worth subscribing to. Uh, there's a nice uh, sort of graduate student guide by Adrian Sampson uh, that's well worth reading uh, along with this talk. I hope these are uh, good resources. LLVM blog keeps you up to date. Uh, there's an IRC that's very active uh, with developers. Other tools uh, that have been helpful for me as a compiler engineer, uh, Hexdump, Meld, uh, and then again, Xdot. Uh, and again, if you're looking for projects about how to learn, you know, just Google, like, you know, I'm in uh, academia. <laughs> Google someone's LLVM homework assignment or something, and you'll find interesting problems. <laughs> uh, OK, so some interesting uh, talks to continue on. Uh, there's a nice YouTube series as well on program analysis, so the full course. Um, so you can learn about some things like data flow analysis, whole program optimization, and really take those forward. Uh, of course, I, I can't leave without saying that you know, contributing to LLVM is a good thing. This is an open source project. Uh, and there's a uh, full guide here. Uh, the LLVM developer meetings, uh, this guide sort of says what the uh, etiquette is, how to commit patches, where you can start looking for uh, low-hanging fruits if you're just starting to get involved. Um, you can start searching from here uh, just to gain some momentum. Okay. So my conclusion, you know, LLVM, I think, is a really exciting tool with a lot of power, even from very simple projects. Um, you know, whether you're working in performance, tool building, uh, or just curious. Uh, and even if you're, you know, you attended this talk and you said, oh, this wasn't the right thing. You know, if you're a C++ developer, at least look through the source code. I think there's some interesting uh, programming in it. So you can always learn by reading uh, from the architecture of this code. Um, and again, this is a big project, but it shouldn't be scary. Uh, it's just new, okay? So you can do it. <laughs> you can run through these examples here. Okay, and that's what I have for you. So I can take questions, but otherwise, uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, yeah, I'll take a, a few, yeah. Uh, yeah, question in the front. Thanks for your talk. Uh, okay, yeah. Do any IDEs exist in which you could make these kind of analysis by right clicking on a function and then the whole thing you described just had, happens behind the question? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so the question was about are there IDEs or tools that exist where you can sort of uh, click on something and maybe statically get this uh, information? Uh, yeah, or or, the, the dynamic or dynamically generated, so you can run it instead. You have to make it all manually. It looks pretty powerful, but also a lot of manual labor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so the first comment, yeah, I automate a lot of these uh, these tests when I uh, run them. Uh, but there are a lot of tools um, where I'd sort of start looking. Is I didn't talk about Clang a lot, uh, but there are these Clang tools. Clang Tidy, um, a lot of these refactoring tools that run alongside IDEs uh, that are constantly looking through the source code with a click, refactors things, gives you information about the program. Uh, so the answer is uh, yes, uh, in, a sh in a short now. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, kind of a uh, follow up question. I want to have code metrics about C uh, object oriented uh, code, like uh, cohesion or class dependency. Yes, the question was about finding uh, cohesion and uh, code dependencies amongst the code uh, and where to start looking. Uh, I know there has been some work on sort of data dependency and looking at uh, which files are dependent on others, especially for figuring out uh, com compilation time, uh, these sorts of things. Um, again, I don't know any off the top of my head, but uh, folks on the IRC would a quick, I could probably Google it uh, quick and find some projects. Um, but the, this is the right tool for that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, so you told us there's an, um, you can generate the IR, um, optimize it, and then use the just in time compiler to, to run it. Yep. But uh, the IR is hardware independent. 
And if it's hardware independent, if you want to optimize it, then you usually use the hardware specific stuff. In it. So after the optimization, the IR is not hardware independent anymore. So. Sure. So the question is um, about uh, running the, uh, once we get the IR uh, from our machines, we run some optimizations on it. And then uh, we can run it through the uh, JIT engine to uh, uh, get some program uh, back and some uh, execution. Uh, so again, the IR, um, because it's independent uh, and sort of uh, not machine specific, right? It's supposed to be a general purpose. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't want to sort of promise on camera that, yeah, you'll get all the optimizations until you uh, generate your final assembly code for your target machine. Uh, again, the JIT is sort of a work in progress. That's something that people are working on uh, right now uh, to fit in some of these uh, optimizations. Um, and I don't know enough about uh, how many of the optimizations are there. But if you are doing some optimizations, like standard ones, dead code elimination, uh, reducing code size, inlining, these sorts of things, will uh, you should see a, a boost. Machine specific, I think you're going to have to test it on the machine, yeah, with the final assembly, yeah. Huh. Unless you want to, yeah. Uh, just a comment. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, IR is not machine specific. Uh, is, uh, is machine, machine specific. So it depends on ABI. Uh, it can include uh, assembly code. So uh, there have been a couple of attempts to make our uh, architecture uh, independent. So like sure. an eight client uh, uh, project uh, and the uh, Gender script inside of Android is also using bit codes, uh, but it's not uh, 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 architecture independent, so it is dependent. Sure, comment is that the IR is uh, architecture dependent. Do you, do you know how much or what percentage? A small percentage, but okay. important. Yeah, it's mostly the data layout, so if you look at the data layout, it says that how big is an int, that type of thing. Not okay, right. yeah. It's sort of the same IR is used for all, you know, outputs from a plan. Yeah. Each instance of an IR, you can't just recompile compile the back end and say ARM if you compile for x86. Sh it, it sometimes works, but it's not guaranteed. Sure, yeah. So common is that the data layout does matter. Yeah, absolutely. OK, yeah. I uh, Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, uh, yeah question. Uh, that's a good question. So the question is about uh, how does uh, LLVM work with a language like Java that is memory managed? Um, I actually, I know there was a Java uh, front end project for this some time ago. Um, I don't have a good answer for that actually because I think that project got discontinued in Java. Uh, perhaps someone else knows something more. I know uh, like the Swift languages, they have their own sort of reference counting implementation. Um, for it. So, so I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, unless anyone else does. Yes. I have a question. Uh, if we run something in JIT, uh, mm -hmm. it's going to use some optimizations in the runtime. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way to see these optimizations? Yes. Yeah, so the question was about uh, the JIT and if it's doing optimizations, can we see them at runtime? Um, again, I haven't uh, played around with the JIT enough to give a concrete answer about that. Um, so certainly you could emit some information. Um, and I don't know what sort of, uh, you could sort of embed some sort of reflection capability to emit something about the code size or how it's improved. Uh, I've sort of played around with some of the profile guided optimizations to figure out uh, hotness. But again, I've looked at uh, that on C++ mostly. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, question in the back then. <laughs> That's a good question. So the question was about uh, using the JIT as a scripting uh, language uh, for, say, a game, where you can sort of optimize as you're going at uh, runtime. Uh, my answer to these questions is always uh, test it and run it and see if it meets your needs. Uh, I'm not convinced the, the JIT, uh, as I've used it on just the LOI, is fast enough for um, that sort of task. 
um, in my experience. Uh, there, are, there are some talks, just a, if the reference, if there are some talks in the LLVM conference about people who've used LLVM for JITs. Uh, they tend to use them as the last stage on a multi-stage JIT, so it'll sort of be, I've determined this section of code is really, really hot, so I can spend a long time. But it's yeah. typically not used as first stage JITs. Yeah, uh, so the comment was that they're typically not used, but there is some talk at the sort of final stages of optimization. Um, do, do you happen to know if it's in the uh, sort of profile guided? Um, <laughs> well, yeah, figure out the hot. Will collect profile information as it runs, yeah. and if it determines that something is really important, it will and is used a lot, then it will go to LLVM. But it's yeah. typically not used as a first it, JIT everything. Yeah, so the comment is it's not used as sort of the, the JIT everything. Um, I've done a little bit of work uh, in gaming specifically on profile guided optimizations. Um, and games are a really interesting use case because they're so dynamic. Um, so they might be a good case to sort of always having them run at some point. Um, but what I've found is uh, where I've gotten the biggest optimizations in, in big projects like game is during a link time optimization uh, where you can have this sort of whole program optimization. Uh, that's where the biggest win's been. That's going to make it take uh, very long, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, there's another comment on the right first, yeah. Uh, pardon, can you repeat the question? Uh, oh, can I write the uh, transformations like I was doing uh, before the uh, so intermediate? Yeah. Oh. I see. So directly on the C++, so I can maintain uh, type information or something. Um, I haven't done any work in that uh, myself. I'm sure that's a problem that's been looked at. Um, I'm trying to think if I can reference anything on that. Uh, again, if anyone has a, a better answer, because um, that, that's an obvious concern. Yeah. Uh, do you have an answer for that, or? Oh, uh, uh, quick question here. Yeah, the next. Yeah. I've got an EDA2 project, and I need a C code parser that I can plug in with my project. And I think uh, the LLVM C long parser is the way to go. Mm -hmm. But uh, so my question is, how to get uh, C long and or I see. Uh, so the question was about getting the uh, CLang uh, compiler, uh, or excuse me, the parser uh, to run. But you only need that specific uh, piece of it. I would like to, to get uh, let just the C code parser uh, entity so mm -hmm. that I can use uh, C code parsing in my own project. Yeah. But I don't want to obtain tens of megabytes of, <laughs> of, of binary. Yeah. Uh, did someone have an answer? I, I know. An yes, an answer. There's, yeah. Um, it's called this claim. Use, yeah. Um, Steam also uses it for like code completion or whatever you get. Yeah, like this uh, is not enough to work with the the ASP. I yes. want to obtain an ASP and leave it to you and does not get that. I I think. Yeah. Yeah. So to repeat, libclang yeah. should give you the uh, the AST. Uh, yeah. So I think I think this is the tool I would inspect. Uh, libclang should give you access to the whole AST. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you create the intermediate uh, representation for every file and mm -hmm. then merge them all together, link them all together. Yep. Uh, if you then run the optimizer on it, um, do you think that is something that's doable once it 
Yeah, so the question was uh, sort of on this idea of I've got a huge project. I want to link it uh, together all of the uh, intermediate representations and generate this sort of giant bitcode file. Uh, so I have done this. Uh, it does take some time to actually build that file, uh, as long as you have enough memory on your machine. Uh, what I have found is that it's usually worth doing this uh, because you get a lot of gains from uh, inlining, uh, which is usually the uh, uh, obvious sort of winner. Um, but you can also uh, play around with some of the instruction layout um, and sort of the, the function ordering. Um, uh, so I think this is a win, uh, and you can do it, and it's worth trying. Um, this, this is something I've had success with. Uh, that's a great question. Oh. Any more All questions? Right. Okay, we'll the All right, thank you very much.